Father, this has been the desire of Jesus for nearly 2,000 years. He prayed that prayer, Lord, before he went to Calvary. In John chapter 17, he released a prayer that has up to this day not been answered yet. He prayed that those who believe in you will be one. And those were the times when denominations didn't exist. Doctrinal differences didn't exist. Racial, cultural differences didn't exist. But all were just believers in you. Having one thing in common and you saw us. You prayed for your disciples and you prayed for those who will believe through your disciples. And lo and behold, the gospel has gone forth to every nation of the world. And we say we are one. But in practice, sometimes we don't do that. Forgive us, Father. We claim to be one. Sometimes in doctrine, even though all believe that you are the Savior, the Lord, we allow our differences to divide us. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for hindering the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17. And make each one of us, Lord, henceforth from tonight, instruments to answer that prayer. We were all nothing before we came to know you. I don't know why we all should claim to be something. Something special so that we won't unite with somebody else. Because of our gifting, our anointing, our church. Forgive our insecurities. Forgive, oh God. But many, many ways we choose to divide ourselves over and over again and help heal your body help us oh lord to be instruments to bring the answer to jesus prayer in john 17. we thank you father and we agree with jesus prayer and we covenant our lives to you tonight that for the rest of our lives it is our responsibility, it is our burden that as a Christian, as a fivefold minister, and as churches representing Jesus Christ on this earth, it is our responsibility to seek to be one in the body of Christ. So we covenant ourselves to bring that oneness in the body of Christ so that your glory may be shown forth the way you so desire. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Praise God. Thank you, musicians. This morning, as I was waiting upon the Lord, the Lord give glimpses of the revival that will be coming to Singapore. And some parts of how this revival will take place, it will, won't be everything there is, but some of the patterns will be like in the book of Acts 19, where as we continue to minister the Word of God, and bring forth the Word of God like Paul did in the school of Tyrannus for two years. That during that time, God works special miracles. And so, some parts of that are going to take place within these two years. And another part, another glimpse that God gave of the revival that is taking place, I like to paint and draw the vision so that each one of you can see clearly. 
visualize fivefold ministers rising up from this nation. And of course, what will happen will be duplicated to every other nation of the world because this message is going forth throughout the world too. But visualize fivefold ministers rising from this nation. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And as they rise and find their place, and find their calling, find the grace that God has on their life, they not only rise and begin to travel one by one, but they rise and became a team in this land and nation. Where the five fall, each strong individually in themselves, each secure individually in themselves, in the Lord, each gifted, anointed, and capable to do ministry on their own, but each rising and becoming a team. And visualize these teams functioning together so that they be, the, the power that is multiplied where one chase a thousand, two chase ten thousand, three hundred thousand and onwards. And as these fivefold ministers unite, the glory of God becomes so powerful, as powerful as the shining sun. That God began to do not just miracles, special miracles, signs and wonders. They will astonish all in awe of the presence of God among His people. And people will begin to come to the Lord in droves. Not only by the thousands, but by the ten thousands and by the hundreds of thousands. So that as Paul shook the entire city of Ephesus, the entire nation shakes with a vibration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then visualize these teams going out, not just one by one, but teams of fivefold going out. And they go all over the nations of the world, far and near. And everywhere they go, they fill the largest auditoriums they could find in every city, in every nation. And the world looks and says, we have never seen this before. We have seen sometimes one great evangelist come and then go. We have seen a great apostle come and then go. We have seen a great teacher come and then go. We have seen a great pastor come and then go. And we are blessed. But we have never seen them function together like this. And all the glory that they have brought forth to entire cities as this fivefold march up and down the nations of the world and they carry with them the glory of God. Because in the vision that the Lord Jesus showed to me on November 17, when He appeared at 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. in Sabah, on my last day there where I was flying back, I saw Jesus holding in His hand what looked like a piece of the sun. It was a glory that is so powerful, it was brighter than the sun. And he said, this is my glory that I reserve for those who work to unite my church. Causing his church to be one. And that's the glory that's going to be released as a fivefold rise and each find their place. And not only each find their place, each find partners among the fivefold. There is no stadium and no meeting place and auditorium big enough to contain the impact of what these teams go throughout the world. That was a vision I saw this morning and some of you felt when we were singing a song just now that love just comes to you 
that vision came with that love. It was like the awesome love of God flowing through. That's a glimpse of the revival that is coming forth. Praise the Lord. Hold that vision because it will come to pass. Up to today, in all of church history, that has never happened. You have seen evangelists, you have seen sometimes two of them together, John Wesley, Charles Wesley. And even through all the Pentecostal revival, at times they came close to it. They came close to it. When at one point, they had a convention in the United States, where there was an apostle, there was Lester Samrell there, and there was a prophet, Kenneth Hagin was in the same meeting, and there the evangelist, T.L. Osborne was there, and there the pastor, John Osteen was there, and there the teacher, Noel Hayes and Charles Katz were there, and all five were ministering together. It was powerful. We had a glimpse. But that's not supposed to be just a glimpse. It is the pattern in the Bible, in Ephesians 4. It is not just a once occasion. It is the method of the Lord. And whether we like it or not, and we all know, if God says something, it's going to come to pass. And if we don't line up with God, God tells us, we are the one who are in trouble because it's going to keep shaking until that takes place. And if we are not faithful, Somehow, we are shorten ourselves and another will take our place. Because God is not looking for who we are. He's only looking for willing vessels. To put His grace on, to do the work that will continue to go forward. If we choose to be the generation that stay behind in the wilderness, He will raise up another generation that will be willing to go forth. To do exactly what God commands in the Word of God. In the fivefold ministry is going forth. And that's why we choose to line up with the Word of God. That's the vision of the revival that is coming forth. Pentecostal history, church history has not seen that before. And that's the next wave that God's bringing forth. The glory like the glory of the sun. Seven times brighter than the sun. Tonight we're going to continue on the teaching that we brought forth yesterday on understanding grace and law. And we spoke about, for the benefit of those of you not here, we, we spoke about, uh, these messages will be on the website and they will be on sale too at some point in DVD format. So if you folk didn't have yesterday's message, you can get hold of that and it will be free on the website as always. And yesterday we spoke about how that grace has many levels. There are many levels of grace. Abundant grace, there is mega grace in Acts 4, great grace and exceeding grace. All this. It tells us that when, to understand grace, there are different levels of grace. When we receive grace, they, we can increase the amount of grace that we receive. Second Peter chapter 1 says, grace and peace be multiplied to us. So it can be multiplied. And then we realize that there are also areas of grace. In Romans 12, they're having gifts deferring according to the grace. So a person might have grace in one area, but not grace in another. Grace in, in, as an apostle, but not grace to be an evangelist. So different types of grace, different types of ministering. Some grace in teaching, grace in prophecy, different types of grace. So they're deferring grace. And then we went forward to John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, to point forth a little word here that talks about how all grace is indeed in Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, which says, And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came to Jesus Christ. And we pointed to verse 16, 
where he says that uh, Jesus had all the fullness of grace, of course. And uh, of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Now the word grace for grace is an unusual phrase in the Greek. The exact Greek word grace is the word charis. And the word for is not the normal word that is translated for. It is the word anti, which is where we get the uh, English uh, transliteration of anti, like antichrist, or used as against. So it's actually charis, anti, charis. Now that's very strange. And long ago I teach this area, uh, years ago, uh, probably decades ago, and uh, that I say grace upon grace. But the exact translation... It's actually grace instead of grace. The word NT has been used in various formats in the Bible. And we give an example in 1 Corinthians 11, how it talks about uh, women and long hair. So their long hair instead of a covering. Long hair anti-covering. So it's like instead of it. And of course, even though the New Testament is written in Greek, there is a Greek Old Testament too, which is called the Septuagint. And when you trace how the word phrase is used, uh, it is used like uh, an Adam uh, had a son say uh, had a had, had another son uh, uh, that uh, instead uh, to save uh, to replace Abel. So it's using the Old Testament Hebrew Septuagint, the word anti again, and the word anti also has been used in phrases like an eye for an eye. So an eye instead of an eye. So the word anti can also be translated in exchange for. An eye in exchange for an eye. And uh, so that phrase is used here. And of his fullness we have all received. And grace in exchange for grace. That's an interesting phrase. And we're saying, how does that function? You see... There are many levels of grace. There are many areas of grace. And so what happens is we all grow in an area of grace. We receive grace and we need to allow that grace to exchange for another area of grace, for another level of grace, for another level of grace. Because grace, as we have shown, is a method when it contrasts with law. Here's where we go to the book of Romans and we catch up with where we were yesterday in the book of Romans. Bear with me as I uh, fill in where we are and just to revise where we have reached until. It tells us here that uh, there is this contrast between grace and law and uh, you also have this contrast in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. It says in verse 4, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And so, there is grace which is through faith, and there is works which is through the law. So in Romans chapter 4, it says in verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. In other words, the grace and faith work together. It is by faith so that it can be that new method called grace. And there's the law. So you have the law versus grace. And they are both in contrast. Let me give one more scripture to contrast the two. And we pick one up from uh, Romans 11 verse 6. We talk about election. Romans 11 verse 6. And if by grace then it is no longer of works. Otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works... It is no longer, no longer grace. Otherwise work is no longer work. So the two 
are opposing. Now, the law through works is trying to get something. And it has failed. But there is a purpose for the law, which we're going to see tonight a little bit more. And since what the law couldn't do, grace came. The law was a method. It was a method to try to reach something. From the outside, God was giving the law. But it could not achieve it. What the law failed to do, grace came. So grace replaced the law. But how is replaced? That's the examination we're giving it. Grace is the new method. The law's method was by works. Grace method is by faith. So in other words, you could say grace was a new method into something. What is that something? And we saw yesterday that grace by itself leads to something. See, when something is a method, it leads onto something. There's an end to that method. In the book of uh, Romans, and we start picking up from where we were yesterday, the book of Romans chapter 5, and we start reading from verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense, for by the one man's offense, many die. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. So he's talking about gift. A free gift that is coming by grace. Grace is bringing something else. Grace doesn't end in itself. Grace was a means to an end. It was not the end. Therefore, being justified by faith, we now stand in grace. That grace is a means to an end. There's something else coming after grace. That grace was to produce something. Which Romans 5 continues. Verse 16, he talks about the gift. Now the word gift here does not refer to grace. It refers to something that grace brings. You can receive this through this grace method that operates through faith. In verse 16, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgments which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift the free gift which came from the many offenses resulted in justification. For by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace. And that's what Jesus came to bring, abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. So grace was a method, a means to get righteousness. It is not to end in itself. It is to reach and get righteousness, which is now a gift. In the law, by works they were trying. They were trying, but they couldn't get righteous. They couldn't get into the level God wants of holiness and righteousness. Always failing. But grace was not able to bring the gift of righteousness. And then when you read on in Romans chapter 5, it says, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. It didn't say, you receive grace, then you reign. It did not say that. It said you receive grace and and the gift of righteousness, you reign. So you stop at grace, it's just like driving from your house or your office to this place, and you just go under the highway but never arrive. 
you need to drive on. And the driving was the grace method to reach the end, which is righteousness and holiness. In chapter 5 of Romans, it tells us in verse 21, So then, as sin reign in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness. You take away the righteousness, the reigning stops. And all this harmonize with all the other scriptures, where it shows Jesus in the book of Hebrews, He has a scepter of righteousness. Now the difference is, this righteousness is not something we can work for. We can earn. It is the gift of righteousness. This righteousness that God seeks to bring is so powerful, it will bring everything else. If you study the word righteous, righteousness in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you will find, it always says, the righteous, you know, will not hunger and thirst. The lions will hunger and thirst, but the righteous will be provided abundantly. All the blessings are for righteousness. Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things are added unto you. So when righteousness and holiness are on our life, nothing can withhold you from all the fullness of spiritual blessings, from all the fullness of soul blessings, from all the fullness of natural blessings. Righteousness, which is now a gift that grace is seeking to bring into our lives. That's the object. That's the target of grace. And that is why in chapter 6, he is no longer talking about grace, although grace is still involved. He talked about being a slave of righteousness. You see, the whole target was righteousness. Grace was the methodology to receive the gift of righteousness. It was not an end in itself. That is how it fulfills the law in the book of Romans chapter 8, where it says in verse uh, 4, three and four, it talk about the law and grace. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous, again righteousness, righteous requirement of the law, what the law was trying to produce, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled not for us, but in us. So something changed on the inside when the give of righteousness takes place. And that, that righteousness thing or that righteousness seed or that righteousness energy or that righteousness power that which will fulfill the law. That which if you have it, the law is fulfilled. That gift of righteousness will be fulfilled in us. It's deposited into our spirits. So that from thence forward, righteousness which is a gift, and by the way, righteousness and holiness are the same thing looking from two sides of the same coin. On one side, holiness, that's God looking at it. On the other side, for men looking at God in fulfillment of all the harmony or all the laws, it's righteousness. They are the same spiritual attribute looking from two points of view. When God says, be holy as I am holy, it's always compared to Him. Righteousness is us in harmony with everything that God created, including Him. So righteousness and the gift of righteousness is at the same time the gift of holiness. That God now gives as a free gift 
true grace. And righteousness and holiness has always been God's target. Which is why as he continues in his flow to show us about this righteousness and what God intends to do, let's uh, look at a few places here in uh, the book of uh, Hebrews. Let's look at the book of Hebrews. And it tells us that it is not a once process. It is a continuous process in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. After showing Jesus Christ our high priest who is tempted in all ways like us, but without sin, in verse 16 it says, Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly, through the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, doesn't that tell us that even though we receive grace, you got to receive more grace each time you need, and more grace. Because there are levels of grace. And righteousness that comes to us when the law is fulfilling us, something was imparted. Grace brought something into our life. The seed of righteousness into us. That seed of righteousness, how does it take place? Where does it start? The book of Philemon, which has no chapters, but it's just a little short uh, letter in verse 25 at the ending of his greeting Paul says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit so grace doesn't come to your physical body although it can become visible as it comes comes and increase it doesn't just come upon your soul although it can increase and affect your soul but grace is a deposit and a, and, and a method by which grace or, or, or God's impartation of His righteousness is produced in you. In your spirit. Where is it all located? Where is all these things happening? In our spirit. So when Romans 5 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Where is peace? Fruit of the Spirit, we know. Everything is part of the Spirit. So as we look at grace and law, this is the whole difference. As far as the law is concerned, this is what the Bible says about the law. So let's let the Bible speak for itself in the book Galatians chapter 3. We always like to bring all these scriptures together. So that we lay a good foundation. In the book Galatians chapter 3, Paul says here, in verse 23 on this, But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. So when, when, the, when grace came, the law takes a different position altogether. In verse 19 of the same chapter, Paul asked this question in verse 19, which is already in some of your minds. What purpose does the law serve? What was the law given for? Paul says in verse 19, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Remember how the law only came in Moses' time. 
although it exists, the law of God has always existed, but it was revealed in detail in Moses' time. Abraham, we are told in Genesis 15, believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. So Abraham was experiencing a measure of the gift of righteousness. But we have the potential, the fullness of the gift of righteousness. The Old Testament, they were told, Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Did they ever succeed? Never. They always keep falling away, fall short of His glory. So the law has its place. And as we contrast the two, the law was trying to make you holy. The law, the Bible says in Romans chapter 7, the law is not evil. The law is not the bad guy. It says the law is good. It's in the Bible. Better turn to it in Romans chapter 7. See, we need to understand how these principles harmonize in chapter 7, verse 12. Do you find it yet? Romans 7, verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy. Look at that. The law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. That's the Bible. So the law in itself was in harmony with holiness, in harmony with goodness, in harmony with justice. Nothing, no, you, can't fail, you can't fault the law. So the law was trying to make us like it. That's what the law is. The law is holy, the law is good, the law is just. It was trying to make us holy. Because if you keep the law, if the law is holy, you keep the law, you are holy. The law is just, you keep the just, you, you keep the law, you're just. The law is good, you keep the law, you're good. So the law was trying from the outside in to make us holy. It did not succeed. Grace came. The law was a method that failed. Because it's from the outward in. Grace is from the inside out. Where God, through grace, deposit the gift of righteousness. Deposit the gift of holiness. And then, you bear your fruit of righteousness. Philippians chapter 1, talk about the fruit of holiness. Fruit grows. Fruit increases. And so holiness, which is a gift, righteousness, which is a gift, is now a gift of God that grows in you. Now, understanding these two is just the outline. Just the outline. We need to know how to allow grace to work in our life, to energize this righteousness and this holiness in us. Because if, if that happens, everything else flows. Why do you think Jesus was so powerful? Because He was holy. He was just. He was righteous. And He could flow perfectly. That gift is ours. Potentially. Now we know that there are different levels of faith, different levels of grace. Therefore, different levels of righteousness. If he says the fruit of righteousness, it means it's there, but it has to grow. Grow. Now, let's examine this fruit of righteousness. What, what is it like? This fruit of righteousness, which I say is, is also holiness. What's it like? What's this fruit? This fruit of righteousness has many flavors. And uh, it is, its flavor is all the fruit of the Spirit. 
Do you know that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, all this fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23, are all flavors of this gift of righteousness and holiness. They're all the different flavors. That is why the moment you're justified by faith, you have peace. The moment you have, you have justified by your peace with God, you stand in the grace, you have the peace with God. Because the moment grace starts working, the moment you receive grace in your spirit, grace brings the seed of the gift of righteousness and that starts working. One of the first two manifestations is peace, love and possibly joy in many people's lives. So when that start, gift starts taking place, it comes forth. It says, prove it. Yes, no problem. In the book of Romans, remember the gift of righteousness? He describes it in the whole of Romans chapter 6 about being a, a slave of righteousness. When you're slaves of righteousness, it means that there's something controlling you. What is a slave? Instead of being a slave to sin, you're a slave to righteousness. That means there's something making you do it. Correct? A slave to sin is, is that the, the energy of sin makes you want to sin. The slave of righteousness is the energy of righteousness makes you want to be righteous. That's what the gift of righteousness is working in us. It's energizing righteousness in sin. It's growing in a fruit of righteousness and holiness in us. In Romans chapter 6. And by the time he, he continues his discussion and reaches the book of Romans chapter 13, in chapter 12, we talk about differing areas of grace. In chapter 13, he says that in verse 19, uh, chapter 13, verse 10, that is, Romans chapter 13, verse 10. He says, he talks about the law in verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love. To love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then he talks about the different laws. And then in verse 10 he says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, here's the logic. The gift of righteousness fulfills the law. Correct? You saw that in Romans 6. Now, if Paul says, Love fulfills the law. Doesn't it tell you that the giver of righteousness and love are related? If A equals to B and B equals to C, therefore A equals to C. Simple logic. So if the fulfillment of the law equals the gift of righteousness, which is a gift, and if love fulfills the law completely, then love and righteousness are related. In fact, they are all the same flavor. To make it easy to understand, because I know I've thrown a whole lot of scriptures that you're all trying to squeeze all this teaching into, you know, one hour. Let's take an example of a fruit. Let's take durian. Okay. Because you've got a big durian, right? One day we might be in the durian. Never know. Your convention center. Is it the durian? You call it the durian, right? It's built as a durian. The durian. To many of you, it's the durian. Anybody here know the scientific name for durian? Durio sibatinus. <laughs> to you, you don't enjoy, do you enjoy eating durio sabatinus? What's that? Is that a salad or something? Well, to God, that substance is called holiness. To us, we call it righteousness. To you, durian is called durian. To the scientists, the botanists, oh, this is durio sabatinus. I don't like that name. I don't like to think that I'm eating the sabatinus. But 
same different angles. One from the scientific, one from the common man's language. From man's point, that, that fruit that he gives us is the gift of righteousness. From God, it's the gift of holiness. It produces holiness. Durian has many flavors. And uh, when you ask people to describe what the flavor of durian, a westerner tells you that it's uh, like Limburger cheese, toilet fruit. Or, uh, you know, some say it was uh, uh, like a camembert cheese with honey and sugar. Oh, okay, I don't know what that is. And uh, so some of us, you try to describe, some describe it like an avocado. Some avocado indeed. Oh, you know, it's a sulfurous fruit. And uh, try to describe the taste. Oh, it's like custard. And... Uh, Durian and well, it has all these flavors. So the f- the fruit of righteousness is like a durian. You could title today's sermon the durian of righteousness. Say, oh God, when will God send his durian of righteousness? This is getting far off. So tonight you impart the durian. Receive the durian of righteousness. Ouch! 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 <laughs> Many flavors, like the knife, knife fruit of the Spirit. The gift of righteousness has all these flavors. And uh, so durian, in here, you know, sometimes people say it uh, smells like hell, tastes like heaven. <laughs> D24, very nice. Some of you like it, D24. Yeah. Have you heard about the D666? I mean, Black in color. <laughs> uh, have you heard about D888? Oh, they want the heavenly durian. See, is there such a thing? I don't think so. If there were a durian plant in paradise, it would have no thorns. Right? It has to be a redeemed durian tree. Some of you say, oh, redeem the durian, keep its flavor. So here on earth, your durian smells like hell. Tastes like heaven. There it smells like heaven, tastes like heaven. The one D666 smells like hell, tastes like hell. So we have righteousness, like a fruit. Righteousness to us, holiness to God, having nine different flavors. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. That's why sometimes you talk about grace and peace to you. Because peace is some of the first working of the gift of righteousness in your life. So when you walk in peace, are you walking to fulfill the law? When you walk in love, are you walking to fulfill the law? Whenever you break the law, or you will begin to feel the fruit of the Spirit going off. Whenever you break the law, you lose your peace, you love, lose your, your love, you lose your joy, you lose everything else. The only way you can experience Galatians 5, 22, 23 is when you're walking in line with the gift of righteousness. So you could say the flavors of the gift of righteousness are all these flavors of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, mercy, temperance. All these flavors are just telling us how this gift of righteousness is working in our life. Understanding that, we all know that we all have received the gift of righteousness and it can grow forth from our life and increase and increase and flow powerfully. And, and some of it, like expressions in the Bible, so powerful it will bring manifold blessings into our life. And so grace and law, they relate together. But people still struggle. They say, why do I receive the gift of righteousness and yet I feel the tug of sin? What's happening here? That's what we're going to solve tonight and show the relationship and understanding it is the key. In Romans chapter 7, passage preached in many, many circles, in many, many books, trying to explain this factor here. It tells us here in verse 12, 
that the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. But that at the same time, there's something about the commandment that we need to know. That Paul says in verse 9, I was alive once without the law. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Sin revive, and I die. That's a strange thing for the commandment or the law to bring. Why is that so? The answer is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it makes this sentence about the law and what it actually does. 1 Corinthians 15, and right towards the end when he talk about the resurrection, and at the end here it says in verse 56. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Say, wow, that's a strange statement. What does it mean? Remember, it says the law is holy, the law is good, the law is just. When you are not dressed properly and you stand with someone who's dressed properly, what do you feel? You feel that you're not dressed properly. <laughs> but if you were not dressed properly, and you're standing with someone who's not dressed properly or worse than you, you don't feel too bad. When you see the law, or the law comes to you, it's like a mirror. Because it's a mirror that tells you what is perfect, good, holy, you begin to feel imperfect. Because it shines and shows every imperfection. It's a super mirror. The law is a super mirror. That when you stand next to it, it shows you all the defects. No, many of us look at mirror, today's physical mirror, you look, it just reflects yourself. But imagine a mirror that when you look at it, that mirror amplifies every defect for you to correct. So you could look at the mirror and you just got one tiny little zit of a pimple. Look at the mirror, it's magnified about two inches big. <laughs> you got one mole that is almost invisible, it's 0.1 mm. Look at the mirror, oh, it's about one, one inch big. That mirror amplifies all your imperfections. How does it make you feel? Ah! That's, how, that's what the law is doing. The law causes you to realize when you're standing next to it, how imperfect you are. Uh, I had a dog who is now uh, gone, passed away, on the dog paradise. <laughs> and uh, he's, he is a, he is a nice uh, Alaskan Malamut, which is like the huskies that pull the sleigh uh, to north and south pole. And, and patches of white all over, cute little fella. And his white looks very white. His, his gray looks nice. And, uh, and you think that that white is white, lovely white part of his fur all over his white, and you not know, like to brush him up and down. But when it snow, it snows about every uh, three, four years, it snows in Canberra. When it snow, he loves it because they're designed for snow. So he rushes out to the field to play with the snow. And you could see the snow is, the fresh fallen snow is so white. And his white fur looks grey. Say, and his name was Mozart. Mozart, you look so dirty in the snow. But before the white, compared to the white snow, he looks white and clean and nice. Now next to the pure white snow, he looks dirty. His white looks great. Looks great. 
That's what the law is. It, it, sort of, it shows you the strength of sin is in the law. It amplifies it. Now, we could leave you here tonight and say, the strength of sin amplifies the sin. Good night. God bless you. <laughs> you can say, hey, you didn't tell us how to solve. Hey, what happened? We want to find how to overcome this. What's the point of amplifying our sin and leaving us looking worse? See, the Bible tells us that the law was... It's so that we realize how horrible we are and we stop being so horrible. Or, in fact, sometimes it makes us even more horrible. It all kinds of reaction to the law. Like Paul says, when the law came, I died. So what's, how does that relate to Grace. And this is where we need to understand the law working with grace. Because the way grace works is that grace, remember the law is by works. Grace is by faith. The law is by works. Grace, the righteousness, is by inheritance. Another way I want to put it, the law is trying to work it way, works its way into holiness. Grace imparts holiness. Big difference. Now, if that is the key, then the New Testament grace spirit is not to understand how to work, but to understand how to receive his impartation. Because from thence onward, remember, it's now, if, if he says that to you, if it's by work, it's not by grace. If by grace, it's not by works. So how to receive? How to get it? Not by works. By impartation. Because grace comes into us and causes us to receive that righteousness. Grace works within us and imparts. Holiness is not by impartation, not by working to receive. So, give you two scriptures which I don't have to turn to, I just quote them to you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. Paul says that I am what I am by the grace of God. Yet not I, but the grace which is with me or in me. So something was in him making him be what he was. He says, I am what I am. In other words, whoever he is, whatever he's become, whatever he does, is that grace working and energizing in him. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells Timothy, be strong, he tells him, in the grace of God. And that's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of God. The word strong is the Greek word en dunamai. From the word dunamis and you add the word in. Which is translated strictly, be strong from the inside in the grace of God. So grace is imparting strength from the inside. And then you put one more verse inside it which is like 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Where Paul says that uh, when he was struggling uh, in his life against all these uh, things that he was facing in chapter 12, he pleaded to the Lord three times and the Lord answered in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. The Lord says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities 
that the power or dunamis of Christ may rest upon me. Now notice how God interchanged things. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in you. Which means grace is related to strength. Which again ties with what I gave you in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Be endunamai, be strengthened from inside. So grace works by imparting strength. That strength is that gift of righteousness, making you be holy, making you righteous. The fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, growing forth from your life. And so on one side, Sin, don't forget this side here, the law is a mirror that amplifies all the imperfections. The strength of sin is the law. So when the law comes, sin sins very big, strengthened. And here, grace is strengthening holiness. How does the two work together? It's like this. If you were never hungry, you would never eat. Of course, nowadays people eat even though they're not hungry. We live in a different world. But generally, when you look for certain foods, it's because you're hungry. Sometimes you look for certain type of food. You're hungry for that food. You desire that type of food. And what's, what the law does is it causes you to actually, to actually feel what you need. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You could do it in reverse. Not so blessed, or no blessing, on those who do not hunger, and do not thirst, and you know for what? For righteousness. For they are not blessed. So, if I'm to be blessed, and be filled, I must hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Thirst for what? Righteousness. The law, although it seemed to amplify sin, strengthen sin, it actually is revealing what we need of the righteousness. Now there are all kinds of sin, all kinds of area. The law amplifies it so that somehow, you feel the need for that righteousness. The Bible even goes on to say, in the book of Romans, let's look back at the book of Romans. And Paul says in the coming of the law, he says here, and uh, Romans chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Then look at verse 13. How then, what is good, and that is the law, how can that which is good become death to me, which is our question? Certainly not, Paul says. But sin, and this is his phrase, look at his phrase. Sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, 
through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Look at verse 13. Remember what I told you about the law? Where the little, little mole become a big giant mole. All the imperfections appear even bigger. And this is what is happening that you need to understand about how the law operates and how grace operates. Whenever the law comes in, in any form, it seems to amplify the sin for a moment. And like Paul says, suddenly all manner of desires comes forth. It is almost, almost like this phrase that sometimes they use in, in medical uh, field. It says, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Say, wow, they don't like the sound of that. Say, well, we're going to operate on you. And this is going to be very, it's going to be look like worse. But after that, it's going to be better. So when the law came, zoom, the strength of sin is the law. Everything seems amplified. And this is where we need to know what to do with our free choice. It is where if we learn to turn to grace. See, the law was what you call in Galatians the tutor. The tutor leads you to grace. And that's not a one-time process, it's a continual process. Because there are many areas of grace. Holiness has so varied areas. Some people might handle money in a holy way, but then they handle uh, uh, their worldly goods uh, in a righteous way. And you know, some people seem good in this area, bad in the area. Some people seem holy in the area, but in this other area, you know, they are just doesn't demonstrate holiness. Holiness needs to come in all areas of our life. We are righteous in all areas of life. And sometimes people are not conscious of the area where they're not holy, not, not yet perfected until the law comes. And as the law amplifies, and this is the process of God, this is the whole process that we need to understand, that the whole purpose was to bring you to grace and to impart. Say, why impart? See, some people say, why not the gift of righteousness just zoom, zap, I become exactly like Jesus. Well, think about it. The problem is not because of God. I mean, how much food do we consume in a year? Maybe a ton. Maybe, you know, let's say you eat some many kilos a day for some of you. One year you ate a ton. Some of you two tons. Could you have sat down and eaten two tons? In one go, you can't. So what was the problem? Your ability to digest and eat it. I mean, if you try to eat two tons, you'll be dead. How much water do we drink? Can you drink the whole reservoir? Now, if you live to be 50 years old, I'll tell you, you probably have drank lots and lots of water throughout your life. Gallons. Could you have drank water for 10 years? I don't know what kind of superpower you have. But your superpower is you drink water for 10 years. So I know exactly what you look like. A globe. A blob. So you drink your water for 10 years and then you know, your hands are very small like that. So you go around, walking around in Singapore like an amoeba, but a giant one. Because 10 years of water, many, many gallons. Big amoeba walking about on Orchard Road. Is that a plane? Is that a... No, you won't say, is that a plane? Is that something else? You say, is that an MRT train? Uh, is that a giant worm? No, it's a human being who just ate 10 years of water. <laughs> so, you, you can't do that. You drink water, you know, a little bit each day, and it imparts into your life. Unfortunately, we, it is our problem on our side. We don't have the ability 
to receive all of God in one shot. We only have the ability to receive the seed by which He continued to drive in and impart, drive in and impart. Day by day He imparts, day by day He imparts. Day by day we have been transformed from glory to glory. So it's a daily process. It's not like you can do it once. And because it's our inability, remember, Grace is by impartation, the law is by works. That didn't work. Now, impartation doesn't seem to work for some people. So, they are terrible. They are under grace, but they cannot get grace. But they are free from the law, but they don't know what to do because they know the law doesn't bring them. So, they are neither here nor there. <laughs> some Christians are there. They are stuck somewhere in Romans 7. Never can get into Romans 8. Because they have not understood that you need to come to abide. You need to come to get the impartation from God. Not just getting people lay hands on you all the time. Oh, Pastor, I got this problem. Impart. <laughs> I feel this temptation. Impart. <laughs> We could lay hands until all the hair comes out. <laughs> it's not the human being. It's something on your inside. Sometimes God uses vessels to impart. But all the time, we each must find Christ. Which is why Paul said in Romans chapter 7, How is he going to be free? He says in verse 22, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. O wretched man, he says in verse 24, who will deliver me from this body of death? Then he says, 25, the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Looking to Jesus, coming to Jesus constantly, like the plant constantly turning to the sun. A seed must grow, the plant must grow. To grow, it must always have the proper environment, nutrition and the sunlight. So you constantly face the sunlight, which is where Hebrews chapter 12 tells us about looking unto Jesus and the growth in God. In chapter 12, he tells us here, in verse uh, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And uh, these are areas where he tells us here in verse 15, and these are the struggles of modern Christian. Modern Christians either face falling short of the grace of God in verse 15. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. He said, I did not know you can fall short of the grace of God. There's a warning here. You can fall short. How do you get short of the grace of God? In other words, it, the grace of God that's inside you, short circuit. Fall short, short circuit. This didn't work. Some of grace not working in your life. Because the root of bitterness came in. But other people like Galatians, Paul tells them, he says, you have fallen from grace. You're going back to the law. So they're going back to the other uh, uh, method of trying to perfect themselves. Uh, let's look at the Galatian problem. Here in, in Hebrews, their problem was uh, they fall short. They fall short. Just couldn't reach. Grace could not be finish or completed in their life. Here's Galatians. A different situation. In verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. The word estranged actually uh, is not a strong translation. The Greek word estranged is, it says, you have made Christ of zero or no effect on you. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. 
And Paul tells them, you started well, why didn't you continue that way? Why did you go back that way? He says, if you received and started in faith, don't you think you will have to be perfected in faith instead of by works? So some Christians, they fall short of grace. Some Christians, they have fallen from grace. And others, in 2 Corinthians 8, they need to have help to complete the great work of grace in their life. Chapter 8, verse 6. He is talking about the grace in giving. In verse 6, Paul says, So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you. Now, the Corinthians had the grace of God to give. Over and beyond the ability. And this is what grace is. Grace gives you the ability that you and I don't have. That's the whole concept of grace. You can't do it, therefore Christ can do it through you. His strength in you. Paul says, I can't, I can't. Three times he cried. God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient. My strength is enough. Not his, my strength, God says. So grace gives you ability you don't have. But grace, how does it work? By impartation. By impartation. And then impartation, we must know how the law of impartation works. Which is why sometimes people, it's an internal system of dependence on God. And we all know it. Sometimes when you are dependent on yourself and your own strength, you are out of grace. You could have strength and yet dependent on God. Like King David. David was a warrior by the time. He started as a young boy, couldn't even wear the armor and walk. But all through the years, he grew. And he became a mighty warrior. He could fight. But he recognized it was not his fighting skill. It was God. So you could be a strong person and yet be dependent on God, and you could be a weak person and be dependent on God. But sadly, many times people have to be weak in order to learn that they, it's God's strength, not their strength. The art of walking in grace is to learn to keep receiving impartations. So the long, long sermon, all these scriptures throwing out, throwing left, right, the whole night we were trying to tell you just one thing. One little secret in how all this grace and how the whole Christian life operates. In fact, it's a summary of all the Christian life. The whole Christian life is based on receiving from God continually imparting not outwardly but inwardly into our lives constantly each day you're receiving something from god you'll be imparted and the whole story is summarized in john 15 abide in me let my words abide in you you will bear much fruit and all this fruit not only the results the works that you will do it includes holiness because holiness produces all the other things righteousness Love, joy, peace, all the other, everything included. It's all the multi flavor of that fruit. The fruit of Christ in you. It's the impartation of the life of God. Why daily? I already answered your question. We cannot receive all at once. You can't drink 10, gal 10 years of water in one shot. You drink a little bit each day. You can't eat ten one year of food in one day. You eat a little bit each day. And then throughout the year, you may consume a ton of food, but it was a little bit at a time. And that's how the Christian life was designed. If we understand this secret of how grace works, we will begin to understand why the whole basis of the Christian life is learning to come to God, wait on Him, and draw on His grace. In Hebrews 4 verse 16, Come to the throne of grace and draw grace, receive mercy, obtain mercy and grace in time of need. In fact, the word time of need is the word eukairos. The word eu in the Greek is always like good. So it's like good time. Kairos is time. Like the word euangelion, which is the good message, a good word or gospel as we translate it. 
and uh, thanksgiving, you know, uh, Eucharistia, which is a, a, a good grace. So the word you, good time, so you put it together, it's like, it's the ripeness of time. It's an opportune time. The problem with impartation day by day, and you study the Christian word, St. Corinthians 3, is day by day transformation, is that every day you receive something. You don't have to feel in the natural, because grace is in the spirit. But you do receive something, and so you keep on exposing yourself, receiving from God. So what happens is here. When the law comes and when you, you, are, you, you have all those temptations, you have all those... Didn't the Bible say Christ was tempted? Verse 15 before verse 16 of Hebrews 4. And what does he tell us? If we, like Christ, are tempted and Christ didn't fall. If you, like Christ, is in any area, the key is run to Him. And this is my challenge to you tonight. Because I know some of you are struggling to be holy, struggling to be righteous, struggling to perfect holiness and righteousness in your life. And this is a problem that faces millions of Christians buying books, buying tapes, listening area, trying to have victory over sin, over things in their life. It is that every time those things come, Run to God straight away. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical place you run to. It's a spiritual place. And you know why spiritual place is more powerful? Jesus says to the woman, the Samaritan woman in John 4, the Jews worship in a temple, the Samaritans worship on a mountain. The day will come when they will worship me in spirit and in truth, which means anywhere, on a mountain, in a temple, anywhere. In the wilderness, in the city, in the country, anywhere. Because it's spirit and truth. So whenever, whenever temptation strikes, in your spirit, turn to God. You see, right in the middle of temptation, yes. Right in the middle when the law convicts you, yes. Somewhere in your inside, you turn. And you draw on the grace of God. You wait upon the, the grace to come. You say, is it easy to draw? How do I draw? You no know, people talk about the armor of God. Is it going to wear the armor? Put on the, how, 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 how? Tell me, how, how, how? For additional tapes that will come in March. <laughs> how? Yes. As long as you are turned in the right direction, we owe your heart to God, the flow is natural. Like you turning on a tap. It's as easy as just turning to God and asking for His strength and drawing on His strength. It will just naturally flow just the right amount each time. And if you do it constantly, now sometimes this happens, that Christians, they actually fall but if you fail, you don't have to be a failure. You're only a failure if you don't come back. If you don't try again. If you stumble and fall, blessed are the steps of a good man. They are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, though he fall, he will not be cast down. You know why? Because the good man keeps turning back to God. So as long as you keep turning back to God. Now, here's the way it says, you kairos, good time. You know why people fall? Because they don't turn fast enough in a good time. They wait till, you know, when, when the law comes, and all their pimples are magnified, all these strengths are... They say, oh, oh, you know, and Satan, very clever, he paints all your pimple to make it look nice. Look at this pimple, beautiful. <laughs> it makes sin look so beautiful, you know. And, and you're, you're looking there, instead of looking to God. So the moment you turn, like the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. 
and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. So you don't have to run through your prayer closet because it might be one kilometer away. Immediately where you are, you turn. See, Christians have not learned that art. We have not been taught. You could turn to God, you know, on the spot. Wherever you are. It doesn't take long. Immediately. Say, Father, I need your strength now. Express it in your own way. Draw on His strength. And then wait and draw. And let His presence grow strong in you. Because it takes time sometimes to fill your cup. Because your cup has been leaking. So you don't say, Father God, oh Father God, quickly help me, I've got to go run now, thank you Lord. You know? Before the water could fill the cup, so you turn on the tap, you go, and you're running with an empty cup. Wait. Wait on the Lord. And some things takes time. See, Kairos time. You Kairos. And if you take time, abide in Him. Abide in Him. Wait upon Him. That strength comes through your life. And as you continue doing it, one day, you find yourself without realizing it, hey, I don't have that temptation anymore. Hey, I don't feel those things anymore. Because your muscles have developed internet. The fruit has grown when the fruit of holiness grows forth a branch in that area where the branch grow, you are automatically holy. When the fruit of righteousness grows in a different area, automatically you are righteous. See, it's that we become slaves of righteousness, that which is inside the energy of the grace of God. It is not I, Paul says, it is not I, but the grace of God in me, with me. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, the Greek word there is not I, but the grace of God with me. It's the word soon in the, in the Greek. The word soon where we get synagogue. The word soon means together with. It is not I, but grace working together with me. How does it work together? My free choice. I choose grace. I choose the way of impartation. I don't choose works. I choose grace. You see, works reacts differently. Works keep trying. Trying. But grace says, I cannot do it. Lord, I receive your strength. I receive more grace. And you draw on grace. And like the flower turned towards the sun, if you turn long enough, you will receive all the sunlight you need. So that the chlorophyll in your life could produce all the f nourishment you need spiritually to cause the energy of sin to be removed in your life, to be reduced to nothing. That's how grace and law operates continue in our life, which is why it's important to continue in prayer, to continue in worship. They continue in that presence. And sometimes, when you don't have a need, you don't have to wait till the time of temptation. And this, I dare challenge you. Sometimes when you spend the whole night for God. You see, even though some of us cannot, you cannot eat for one full year. But it is possible to eat sufficient and go without food for at least two days. Your body still can function. So you still can stretch a little bit. And I had gone fasting seven days, just liquids. We're on 40 day fast. So it is possible to survive on less food for some time when you've got proper nutrition. Sometimes you spend a whole night with God, and the grace you receive in that one night with God, it carries you for one or two weeks. Some of you experience that in your Christian life. When you were with Christians, when you were in fellowship, when you were active in prayer meetings, active in worship, when you were just always in the presence of God, for one day in the presence of God is better than a thousand days. When you spend time in the presence of God here and there, you notice something. You did not fall easily. 
You did not feel the draw of sin easily. Because the grace carries over. You have more than sufficient to face every battle. But when you become isolated, you thought that prayer meetings are no longer important. You thought that seeking God is no longer important. You thought that waiting upon God is no, uh, is no, waiting upon God is no more important. You're no more spending that presence of time in worship, giving time to God. You're just busy, 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 just do, doing, 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 doing. Your grace is diminishing. And by the time you need strength, you know, you cry immediately, you're almost drowning. Sometimes too late. You flip-flop a few times before you get back on your feet. But it's far better to keep drawing grace. And I challenge you with this. You could draw reserves of grace. Reserves of grace. And that's why we fast 40 days every year. Because we fast for the entire year. And it's good. You dedicate the entire year. And not only that, after the fast, once a week, still seek God. So it's constant. Constantly you're drawing more than sufficient grace. And you draw not just for yourself. An abundant grace you will draw for others. And the grace of God can be mega grace. Where the Bible says grace can be so powerful that when, when uh, Barnabas came to see the church in Antioch, Acts 11, he saw the grace of God. The grace of God flowing powerfully. So it can become visible in your life. The key is not just have grace. Abundant grace. Abundant grace. Aim for abundance of grace. Every place, everywhere that the presence of God is, draw grace. Your own prayer closet, draw grace. Continue in that. Let's pray. Father, we just come before your presence. Lord, we have spoken of things, oh God, that we try to squeeze and summarize into this understanding in the Christian life. You know the hearts, you know the lives of your people. You know the struggles in each life. You know the weaknesses we face. Father, you know areas in our life. Some of them from our own past, some of them by association, some of them by inheritance, many, many different ways in which we develop weaknesses, flaws, sin nature, creeping into our life from the original sin. The law keeps batting us over the head showing us all our sinfulness where we know where we fall short fall short of your love fall short of your righteousness father you know each heart and each life even here tonight we ask so father that you would begin to do a deep new work in our hearts and our spirits even tonight so you come into your presence, Lord. And can we sing that song, All to Jesus, I Surrender? You can sing it in G, whatever. Let's all rise together. Father, you see our hearts and see our lives. And the Holy Spirit has been speaking to hearts and lives here. Healing is wonderful and He will continue to do healings in our life and miracles. Well, it's wonderful to enjoy and to be a blessing to people. But the most beautiful thing is holiness and righteousness. Because these are the attributes that produce health, wealth and everything else. Tonight the Lord calls us unto holiness. Not holiness by the law, 
by holiness, by the gift of righteousness, through grace. And even as we stand in His presence, there are different things that we're going to call out. We do not want you to come out individually in this. Because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But we do know that there's a need of cleansing in the body of Christ. Because some people are falling short of grace. Some people are falling from grace. They're walking in a law even though they started in grace. Others need grace to be completed in their lives. And that's what we're seeking to do, to complete grace in our life. To draw those who have fallen, to draw those who fall short, to complete grace in their lives. Because sometimes another person's grace can cover us. And sometimes the local body's grace, the local church grace can cover the people and the members. But it's most important to develop our individual avenue of grace to developing God. These are the things the Spirit of God has been revealing. I'm a bit hesitant, but I want to obey the Lord. There's some of you here who have struggled not with the actual act of sin yet, yeah? but you struggle with pornography, sins of the mind. And the Holy Spirit wants to do a cleansing work in your life. You went tonight. So this each time you feel the drawing that you learn to turn to grace to be free from that. There's also some, I see a vision, but I will not describe, struggling sick with secret life of smoking, hiding it from people. God knows all these things. In fact, in our midst, are those who have not been faithful to their marriages the Lord knows also there are those who are dishonest in many areas God knows but tonight is not a night of condemnation it's a night to recognize that what we lack is the grace of God to grow in those areas of holiness and righteousness. Righteousness and holiness is not based on what we do or don't do. It's based on our nature. Whether our nature is to love righteousness or to and love holiness. Whether our nature is of love or not. And there are those here who have allowed the root of bitterness to cause your grace to fall short. And you wonder, Lord, why is your grace not working? Simple. Hebrews 12. The root of bitterness. So that you're falling short of grace. Doesn't seem to work in your life. Oh, we thank God. And no matter what area God is talking about tonight, there's only one clear path. Love. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love as Jesus loved. And you know the problem why we fall into sin? Simply because we don't love God enough. That's all. We're not in love with Him enough. 
So the problem was not trying to be holy, trying to fight, fight sin. The problem was, you need to receive more grace and more love from God. So that as God's grace come into you, it will draw the love out, cause you to love God. And allow Him to work in your life. So whatever areas of imperfection some of you are facing, and tonight, God is calling you onto that. Some of the areas I've spoken about. Lord is saying, do you love Him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? Do you love Him? And God knows you cannot love Him by your own strength. But tonight, He will give you the love to love. His grace brings the love to love. To establish holiness, righteousness in your life. He has already imparted part of that when we were singing before the message. That was what tonight was love imparting. If some of you felt that. Some of you are already freed of that without knowing it. You feel something different. You find you cannot go back again. But tonight, as we sing that song once again, I just want to give an open, just a general open invitation between you and God. For some of the work that He was starting to do tonight, some of you is all done, all complete. God bless you. But for those that need that seal and touch of God, this call is for you. That we could pray and complete the grace of God that God has begun in your life. That you want to walk a walk of holiness, righteousness, not by your strength, by the grace of God. As we sing the song, All to Jesus I Surrender. I'd like you to come forth, knowing what is going on between you and God. And no one should be condemning your sin. No one should be interested in any area, only between you and God. And you just need the touch of God's love to increase in your life. So sing that song. You come right to the front.